Working and living in the late 1800s in industrializing and urbanizing United States was difficult. Most people had to simply survive in bad housing with low pay, but they got through it. Just within New York City, the difference between the way that the management, the owners, the industrialists lived and their workers lived was different as night and day. Work varied according to where you did it, whether you were in a factory or in a field or in a mine, but the conditions under which people worked were pretty much the same. Low wages, dangerous working conditions, unhealthy working conditions, with no fallback like vacations or leaves. Many immigrants found work in what were called sweatshops. These were often just floors of buildings where the workers would gather, in this case, to make garments. Now, some women who had children at home would go to the factory, pick up the pieces of the garments, take them home, sew them together, bring them get back to the factory and get paid for each piece that they finished. In the mines, there were no safety standards. And so every time a miner went into the mine, he did so at the risk of his life. But another interesting thing about this photograph, you notice the young boy in the front. Child labor became the uh, symbol of the exploitation of workers for many Americans. This young boy probably had to go to work to help support his family. Children were paid less. And even a child who was not working in a factory had responsibilities for the family. In this case, the young boy is carrying a growler, a can to get beer at the local saloon. There was no such thing as bottled or canned beer back then. If you wanted a, a beer, you had to go to a saloon. Or in this case, the boy would take his growler, have it filled up so that his father would have beer when he got home from the factory. This image also played into the idea of social Darwinism. Critics of the poor, of the working poor, would say, see, this is just proof that they are not being thrifty because they're wasting money on beer. If they really wanted to succeed in America, they wouldn't be wasting that money. So it's their own fault that they're poor. It's not the system's fault. It's not the factory's fault. Under social Darwinism, it's their own fault. And this would be a picture that they would show to prove that the poor were making themselves poor. For in this instance, by buying beer. And many of the pictures we have of work during this era, 
are of children working because they were seen by the upper and middle classes as victims. For example, this young boy working in a, a leather shop obviously has been injured and abused. Perhaps it was a boss that punished him for making a mistake. Perhaps he got beat up on the way to work by a gang. Who knows? Here's a teenager working in the mines of West Virginia. He has been working there a while because he's worked his way up to driver. That's the whip around his neck. A driver was the person who drove the mules pulling the carts down into the mine and then driving the mules back out with a load of coal. Employers love child labor. They paid them about a quarter of what a working man would make. And they were small, they were nimble, they could fit into places where adults could not. For example, this drawing of a coal mine. Rather than building a whole big shaft that an adult could get into, they used children to pull the sleds full of coal out through a shaft that was too big for a man to fit in. These are what were called breaker boys. Their job, 12 hours a day, six days a week, was to sit by these chutes and the coal that had been dug out of the ground would tumble down these chutes and their job was to reach in and pull any rocks that were not coal out as the coal tumbled down the chute. Obviously, they were going to get hurt. But if they didn't do their job well enough or quick enough, notice the boss on the right with his stick to enforce the idea that you should do your job quickly and thoroughly or you would be punished. But these children, particularly immigrant children, didn't have a choice. Perhaps their money that they made as a carrying a porter in a glass factory, as this boy is, would be the difference between whether they were able to pay the rent or have food for the rest of the family or be able to buy shoes for the winter time. Some children out on the streets tried to make a few pennies by selling newspapers in this case. This newspaper boy probably got up in the middle of the night, went down to the newspaper factory, bought some newspapers, and then walked up to the business district to try to sell his newspapers, hoping that he would have enough profit to buy a meal and to buy more newspapers the next day. But child labor was common throughout the United States. Here is a young boy pulling a sack that's almost as big as he is as he picks cotton, probably a sharecropper's son. So it was not child labor that was so appalling to so many. It was the conditions that the children, particularly the immigrants' children, worked in in industrial America. Because in those factories, children were told to do jobs that were dangerous. For example, in this cotton mill, 
See those big spools of thread that are going into the weaving machine to make cloth? Well, sometimes the thread would get tangled. Something would go wrong. And rather than shut down the machine, these children with their small hands were asked to reach in and untangle the thread or to climb under the machines and get them working properly again without having to turn to shut down production. It was dangerous, but children were valued because they could fit into places that adults couldn't. So what did this kind of labor do to children? Well, as is seen in this picture of child workers in a cotton mill in Macon, Georgia, they don't look like they believe that their future is that bright, do they? They look like old, worn down people, not happy children. And this became a focal point of reformers who saw scenes like this as taking childhood away from children at the, for the profit of the industrialists. So as this video talks about the working conditions, the pay, working in America for the vast majority of people was a hard life. Now you might ask, well, why didn't the workers join together and protest, go out on strikes? They did. They tried to form labor unions, but the power was in the hands of the industrialists and the industrialists were pulling the strings of government. And so in the eyes of many Americans, labor was a troublemaker. They were not legitimately standing up for their rights. For example, what became known and was dubbed by the press as the Haymarket Riot, was really workers gathering together to discuss what they were gonna do because their company had just allowed, had just announced wage cuts. And so the workers gathered in Haymarket Square to talk about what their response to the company cutting their wages was. And some were anarchists. They wanted to just burn the whole thing down. Most just wanted to find a way, whether it be go on strike or protest, to get wages restored. And so they were meeting in a peaceful assembly to talk about that, to talk about ideas of how to react to their wages being cut. The mayor of Chicago drove by in his carriage on his way home for supper that night and said it was a peaceful gathering. However, at some point, someone and we still to this day do not know who did it, threw a bomb into a group of policemen. It killed several policemen. And the police reacted with violence and began clubbing and shooting the workers. They arrested the leaders of this gathering. And they were convicted of murder, even though there was no evidence that they had any connection whatsoever with the bomb that was thrown. 
In fact, it was never proven that the bomb was not thrown by some agent of the factory owner to try to stir up resentment against the workers. And in fact, because the industrialists controlled the press, this peaceful meeting that was interrupted by a bomb that nobody knows who set it off was dubbed a riot. And thus, in the mind of much of the public, it just reinforced that workers were violent. Workers did not have legitimate concerns. And therefore, it worked against having any sympathy for workers in America. While there were thousands of strikes and workers were forced to sign contracts before they could work, saying they would not join a labor union. Anybody who tried to organize a union would be fired or worse. And this is kind of what happened in one of the most famous and important strikes of the era. It was at Carnegie's Steel Mill in Homestead, Pennsylvania, called the Homestead Strike. The wages had been cut, hours extended, and working conditions were dangerous. The workers went on strike. Homestead became a battleground because Carnegie's right-hand man, a man named Frick, was determined that the union was not going to succeed in striking the plant. He began to try to bring in scabs, as they're called, non-union workers, to replace the workers from the plant that were on strike. The strikers would not let the scabs into the plant. So Frick called in the Pinkertons. Pinkerton Detective Agency had been formed during the Civil War and was kind of the precursor to the Secret Service. After the war, they became a private army for hire for the industrialists. They had more arms and more men than the U.S. Army. And so Frick called in the Pinkertons to put down the riot, and it became a massacre. And so, as this video explains, while the Pinkertons were attacking the workers and the workers were fighting back, in the press, it gave the impression that the workers were at fault. They were the ones who were being the aggressors when that was not the case. And it broke the union and it set the unionization of steel workers back for 20 or so years before they could finally get together enough people to try to unionize again. Often the industrial managers called on the local police or the governor to send in the National Guard, and in some cases even called on the president to send in the army. During a railroad strike, the railroad owners told the president that the railroad was not being able to deliver the mail, and therefore it was a federal problem, and the president sent in the army to run the railroads and put the strikers out of a job. So government, law enforcement, 
was also stacked against any attempts by workers to improve their wages and their working conditions. And yet the only alternative that the workers had was to unite in labor unions. And the industrialists used every power that they had to defeat the labor unions. Think of it this way, wherever you work, what would happen if you went in as an individual and said, boss, I don't think the working conditions here are safe and I need a raise. Probably you would be told to shut up, go to work, or you're fired. But if everybody in the store where you worked or in the company where you worked went in as a group, management would have to at least listen. That's the idea behind labor unions. But organizing them in the late 1800s was often a deadly exercise. One of the leading labor leaders was a man named Eugene Debs. He started off simply being an advocate for workers. He became president of the American Railway Union and as such put on the first nationwide strike because most strikes were local. It was against the local plant. Most unions were local. Plant A located so-and-so would have attempts to unionize its workers, but there weren't widespread across industries unions. That's what they were trying to build. But for Debs, he led the strike and it was shut down by the government. And so the more he worked with labor, the more he became convinced that simply unionizing was not good enough. And ultimately he became a socialist, advocating that factories and companies should be owned by the workers not by the industrialists. And he ran for president of the United States as a socialist candidate several times. The most notable in 1920, when he was imprisoned because he spoke out against World War I. And even as a prisoner, he received almost a million votes for president in that 1920 election. Another leading labor organizer was known as Mother Jones. She worked with the United Mine Workers. She, like Debs, however, became radicalized because of the lack of progress. And she would ultimately end up being a, an officer and supporter of the most radical of the labor organizations, the IWW, the International Workers of the World, also known as the Wobblies. It was a similar path for Big Bell Haywood. He was a labor organizer who got frustrated with the lack of progress in the minds of the West. And so he became the president of the International Workers of the World, the IWW. He became a socialist. And ultimately he became such a big pest and threat to mine ownership that they framed him for murder. And before they could convict him in a rigged courtroom, he fled. To Russia. Violence was used by both sides when trying to get improvements for workers. Workers would use violence against strike breakers. 
not allowing them to go to work. Management would use violence against the strikers. And so many times these strikes turned into deadly affairs. As the biggest businesses in the United States, railroads were a logical target for labor to organize, to try to get better working conditions, better pay. And so anytime you had a casualty of a railroad worker, that was fuel for the fire of trying to unionize railroad workers. Because more and more people began to see industrial America, and particularly the railroads, as simply grinding human beings into cogs to fit in the machine. Now, this is a picture from a 1920s Charlie Chaplin movie, but it captures the growing feeling that industry was destroying humanity on the wheels of progress. And as industry became more monopolistic, the railroads were controlled by fewer and fewer people. The petroleum industry was controlled by John D. Rockefeller. Steel was controlled by Carnegie. This gave them even more power to exploit labor because workers had no alternative. They had to work for the terms set by the company or they didn't work at all and they starved to death. And so labor began to take on the monopoly that the industrialists built. This crash course video gives a good summary of the industrialization of the United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Living in the United States was very different depending on your economic status during the late 1800s. You had the worker girl on the left or on the right, and the properly dressed young lady on the left. There was a growing gap between the rich and the poor, but there was also the development of a middle class of management. The managers of these large companies were doing pretty well and they aspired to upper class status. And so in many cases, they would uh, go along with the beliefs and the styles and the uh, working or the living realities of the upper class. There was a proper th way to live set by the standards of the upper class. And the middle class were expected to abide by those standards. Here you see a formal portrait of a middle class family. What it doesn't say is that this was considered the only proper way to live. For example, my father told me the story of his grandfather who was a Methodist minister in 1900s or 1800s. And he said he remembered as a little boy watching his grandfather mow the grass on the, of the church parsonage in his full suit, coat, and tie because it was inappropriate for a minister to be seen 
in any less dress. And the role of women in this middle and upper class had not really changed since the 1840s. A woman's role was to take care of the family and make the home so that the man need not bother himself with domestic matters. He would earn the money, she would take care of her husband and her children and the home. This was the proper role for a woman in America. Or as women were told from the pulpit, a good Christian woman was sweet. Her first obligation was to be happy, a sunbeam in the house, so that when her husband came home from fighting the battles of the business world, everything was sunlight and happiness. This was a woman's role. But some of these middle-class ladies were determined to gain greater rights for themselves. And this focused primarily on getting women the right to vote. And so here you see a, Co a Colorado protest advocating suffrage for women, the right to vote. These women's rights advocates formed the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Again, middle-class women who had some leisure time. Their husbands were making the living and they could afford childcare or maid service at home. And this gave them time then to advocate for the right of women to vote. But one of the phenomenons of industrialization was that you had leisure time. On the farm, you pretty much worked from sunup till sundown. But in the factory, you might work a 12 hour shift, but they gave you 12 hours a day to do something else. And so the concept of leisure grew as industrialization grew. Now it might be leisure like a ride that these upper class folks are taking. Or for the lower and middle class, it might be a trip to the theater for vaudeville. Vaudeville was a variety show. They would have usually seven or eight acts on the bill. They might start off with what was called a dumb act, an act where you didn't need to hear it. So it might be a pantomimist or something like that. Then you would have singers and dancers and jugglers. And this became the most popular form of theater in America. And middle and lower class people attended, but the upper class shunned vaudeville as too low class. Interestingly enough, it was vaudeville that introduced the movies to the American viewing audience. They would use, use the new invention of the motion picture as a chaser. In other words, after the live acts were finished, then they would show a movie, a short movie, maybe five minutes long, figuring that people would just be bored to tears and would get up and leave so that they could do the next show. But it turned out that the movies were more popular than vaudeville. And so when movies that told a story began to be produced, 
in the first part of the 20th century, they began to replace the variety show of vaudeville in the hearts of the viewing public. And so while vaudeville may have introduced the movies to the public, the movies ultimately killed vaudeville. In urban areas, they began to build amusement parks, places of recreation. This is a picture of Coney Island, in New York City, where you have a roller coaster, you have a beach, you have a place where people can go for a day's outing and amuse themselves. Maybe the outing was just to take a walk out in the woods, away from the city. Now, this is a pretty risque picture for the era because these women are showing their ankles as they wade in this stream. But you'll notice that they are properly dressed. Their skirts would reach their feet. They wore corsets. If you didn't wear a corset, you were not properly dressed. And the popular music of the era was ragtime. Its leading composer was a black man named Scott Joplin. In fact, ragtime grew out of the black honky tonks. And therefore it was thought to be evil by the standards of white society. But it was so engaging that even the white audiences came to love ragtime. Here are a couple of examples of Scott Joplin's ragtime compositions that you will recognize. They have been moved, used in mo countless movies and TV shows, but in the 1890s, to white moralists, this was the devil's music, in large part became because it came out of the black community. We will see this again and again. We will see it with jazz. We will see it with rock and roll an R and B, that because it comes from black culture, it is somehow damaging American society. And as we will see with other forms of black music, whites quickly take it over, but they civilize it, they tone it down, it is not so ragged anymore. That's what Irving Berlin did when he wrote Alexander's Ragtime Band. It used ragtime rhythms, but you could play it with a band or an orchestra and not just a bunch of people banging on a piano and a honky tonk. Now, until the 1890s, if you wanted to hear music, you had to either make it your own by buying sheet music and learning how to play and sing it, or by going to a band concert or an orchestra concert. There was no such thing as recorded music. But beginning in the 1890s, you had the beginnings of recorded sound. And music was a logical medium for recorded sound. And so you get the beginnings of the recording industry. Other popular amusements in the late 1800s included professional baseball. It was the first major professional sport. Boxing became a huge sport for spectators. And you notice these are spectator sports. 
for people living in the cities, for these workers, getting out and watching rather than participating themselves became the norm. Perhaps back on the farm, you got out and you played ball out in the field, or you had uh, organized fights. But now, most people are not participants. They become spectators. And so the amusements change from participant to spectators. Restaurants, beer gardens, these kinds of things had not been a particularly big part of the American social scene until the late 1800s. And much of that was because of the immigrants. They were accustomed, for instance, the Germans to having beer gardens where people would gather to eat and drink beer. And they brought this to the United States. And you had the beginnings of where restaurants were not just of for working people looking for a quick meal. They became places of a entertainment. Another amusement that became hugely popular in the 1890s was riding bicycles. This kind of combined the new mechanical age with the freedoms of being able to do an activity as an individual. In a society where so much was controlled by other people, the freedom of simply riding your own bicycle had a huge appeal, particularly to urban workers and urban citizens who wanted to find a way to get away from the city for a while you could ride your bicycle. Once again, I will use Crash Course to give you a summary of the impact of urbanization on American life. The impact of work and the types of work and labor and how what they did to the way Americans lived.